good afternoon everyone once again welcome to belgrade welcome to the spring school and pilot master program in law and gender uh, my name is nikola Ilic. i'm an assistant professor at the university of belgrade faculty of law department of economics and today i'm gonna hold a course titled gender economics uh, i'm gonna give you a short preview of the lectures and the discussions that we are going to have uh, but first of all, uh, I would like to express my, my kindly to express my deep gratitude to, to Professor Dragica Vojodinovic and all other professors involved, uh, because the Law and Gender Project is a, a remarkable achievement and a huge success for the University of Belgrade and especially for the University of Belgrade Faculty of Law and all other faculties involved. So, with that being said, it is my great pleasure and privilege to be here today and to be able to present in front of such a great audience online and offline. Um, uh, so, just a short preview. Today, we're going to have three lectures, uh, one hour each. And we should have three lectures and a discussion group, but I would like to suggest at the beginning to have three lectures and to include discussions to have basically discussions within those three lectures to make uh, those lectures interactive. I really love and I have interactive groups, so uh, always when you have some questions or comments, uh, feel free to ask during the lectures and we may prolong a little bit lectures so to include those discussions and to have discussions within lectures. So once again, whenever you have some question or a comment, feel free to ask, do not hesitate to ask. Uh, it, it's really good to have those discussions during the lectures. Uh, so, uh, during the first lecture, uh, we will define gender economics and explain what do we mean when we say gender economics. Uh, and basically, when we define gender economics, we'll be able to make some uh, basic uh, cross-societal and historical comparisons. And that will be the basis for the second lecture, and within the second lecture, we will discuss the main uh, economic indicators and gender indicators. And you'll see why those indicators are so important and relevant, non not only for gender economics, but also for other social sciences like law, uh, sociology, and other gender studies. Uh, so that's why uh, we will deal with uh, indicators of gender within the second lecture. And finally, within the third lecture, uh, we're going to deal with some more with some specific issues like gender and innovation, gender and entrepreneurship will uh, identify some uh, problems in these fields and, and I would like you to suggest some of the possible solutions for those problems. So um, it would be uh, especially good to have discussions within this, uh, the third lecture because those are the most specific uh, issues that uh, we're going to discuss. But before that, uh, we have basically to explain some basic things related to gender economics, and we may start with the first lecture. Uh, just a second. Now everything should be good. And of course, if you have some questions uh, for, for the people who are listening online, uh, feel free to ask also, uh, or, or to send a message uh, within a chat, wherever you prefer, feel free to ask in any event. Okay, so during the first lecture, uh, first of all, definition of economics. I know this is like a common sense, but uh, it's it's useful to, to start from mainstream or classical economics to define economics and to understand critical study of economics. And based on that, we'll be able to, to understand and, and define gender economics or feminist economics. Those are the synonyms. When you read gender economics or feminist economics, it's completely the same. And finally, uh, we'll be able to make some cross-societal uh, comparisons uh, based on all these things. So let's start briefly with, with economics or mainstream economics, classical economics. Uh, many of you are familiar, I guess, with, with economics in general, but that, that's the study of scarcity and its implications for the use of resources, production and economic growth. To put it simple, uh, we have some resources and all those resources are scarce. We don't have enough of those resources, in other words. And economics, it's all about how to use those available resources, resources that we have in the most productive way and how to maximize social welfare. So 
in in <laughs> in basic terms that's that's all about when it comes to economics how to use those uh, resources that we have in in the most productive way and how to create better societies better economies uh, wealthier societies and in in one word how to maximize social welfare within economics we have traditional division uh, we we may uh, differentiate uh, microeconomics and macroeconomics that's also you'll see it will be relevant later on for, for gender economics. And when it comes to microeconomics, uh, microeconomics deals with the behavior of individuals like uh, consumers, producers, and how market functions, how we have prices, how, how they are created and so on, and how we allocate resources uh, in the market, within the market. And of course, interaction between those individuals participating in the market. So that's about uh, microeconomics. And macroeconomics is a, is a specific branch and deals with the structure, uh, uh, economy as a whole or aggregate economy. And also there are different divisions within macroeconomics, but we don't have to go there. Uh, it's important just to, to uh, uh, differentiate those two fields. Uh, microeconomics on a micro level explains how individual functions, how they behave, how they are making their decisions. And macroeconomics, how economy as a whole, for example, supply and demand of money, inflation, and so on. Those are all par excellence uh, macroeconomic issues. And uh, when we are talking about development of economics, and those branches, it's important to, to mention that we have a lot of new sub-branches, some call it methods of economics, like behavioral economics, labor economics, environmental economics, you name it, many, many new fields of economics. And uh, for example, I'm just going to mention some of them. Uh, later on, we'll be able to make comparisons between those branches and, and gender economics. Uh, I'm just going to make a, a I'm just going to explain some of them. Basically, all those branches and subfields of economics are based on the critiques or critical studies of mainstream or classical economics. And uh, uh, to make it clear, uh, we do not negate uh, classical or mainstream economics. We cannot avoid, uh, avoid mainstream economics when explaining markets, economy, and all other issues uh, related to, to the functioning of the market and the economy and so on. But we may improve uh, economics, mainstream economics, and, and those critiques basically uh, uh, improved a lot economics during the, the last century or last 20, 30 years and so. Uh, we got many, many new subfields within economics, and they're all based on the critiques of mainstream economics. Uh, for example, uh, just to mention one, one example to, to, to make it clear, uh, mainstream economics or economics are based on among other things, on the presumption of rationality. So when we analyze markets, when we analyze consumers, producers, we assume that they are rational uh, and that they are making their decision in that manner. But basically, behavioral economics, which is a specific combination of psychology and economics, explain that's not always the case. And these are some of the examples. And among the other things, Tversky and Kahneman, they, they got a Nobel Prize in economics for their findings within behavioral economics, even though 50 years ago, mainstream economists would say that uh, behavioral economics does not exist. And, and they, they were completely negating behavioral movement within economics. But still, you may see Tversky and Kahneman, they, they got a Nobel Prize in economics for their findings uh, within uh, behavioral economics. Uh, and uh, I, I think there is a huge probability that something similar will happen in the future with, with gender economics, definitely. Uh, but just to explain a little bit more, uh, behavioral economics, how they basically improved uh, mainstream economics. They, they discovered so-called cognitive biases. When we behave rationally, but not completely rationally. And for example, they discovered framing effect, anchoring effect, and many other effects. But just to, to, to make it clear how it functions, for example, they, they did experiment. And that's also that's one of advantages of uh, uh, gender economics, be, because we have bring objectivity to social sciences, including law and other gender studies. They made an experiment with students, PhD students, uh, uh, and they had to pay a tuition fee. And for example, they had two groups of students and exactly the same periods, for example, uh, both groups, they had two periods to pay the tuition fee. And for the first group, if they pay within the first period, for example, during November, uh, they will pay a normal price. 
If they do not do that and pay during the second period, during December, they will pay normal pl uh, price plus penalty. So they will be penalized for that. And the other group, uh, they, ex uh, they had exactly the same periods, November and December, but uh, the, the framework was completely different. If they pay during the November, they will get discount and the price is exactly the same as the regular price in the first case. If they do not pay during November, they will pay the full price. So there is no any penalty, they will pay, pay the full price. So the periods are exactly the same and the prices are exactly the same, but you guess within the first group, more people paid within the first period or during November because they wanted to avoid penalty. And in the second case, less people paid during the first period because who cares about discount? We'll pay normal price, regular price. And this is an example where you see that we are not completely rational and our decisions basically depend on a framework or a broader framework, how we basically, and that affects our final decisions. Also, there are many, many other uh, effects like anchoring effect. Uh, they were asking participants to calculate within five seconds the products of the numbers. And you may see uh, on the slideshow uh, one times two times three, and in the other case, eight times seven times six. And within five seconds, you don't have enough time to think about that uh, and to calculate. And it seems like that in second case, we have a higher result, higher product. Uh, 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 but basically, it's all about anchoring. When you see a higher number that affects in the first place, that affects your final decision. For example, uh, they were asking students to, to estimate to estimate how many countries we have in the world recognized by the United Nations in the States. Uh, the, uh, the experiments was conducted in the States. Obviously, for them, that's not so easy question. And, and But before that, they had to read aloud first two digits from their identity cards. And interestingly, students who had higher numbers within those two digits, they estimated that there is more countries, that we have more countries in the world recognized by the United Nations. Uh, students who got, for example, one and two, like uh, uh, not so high numbers uh, uh, for, for the first two digits in their identity cards, they estimated a lower number of countries, that there is less countries uh, in the world. So basically, uh, they were all under the influence of the anchoring effect. When you see something, it's not related to, to your a uh, uh, problem that you're dealing with, but somehow that anchors you and affects your final decision. And based on those small improvements, basically, and critiques of mainstream economics and classical economics, behavioral economics did amazing things, and eventually they got a Nobel Prize, and they are still flourishing, I would say, uh, uh, both in fields of psychology and economics, and they substantially improved mainstream economics, even though they were rejected at the beginning, and I, I think that something similar is happening with gender economics. We're going to talk about right now about that, uh, because gender economics is also a critical study of economics, with a focus on gender aware and inclusive issues and policy analysis. So that's, that's just a broad definition or, or, uh, of gender economics and we're going to go into details. But basically it's also critical study. So that's important to emphasize. Uh, we, because today people think if you're dealing with, with uh, gender economics that you are rejecting economics or you are not an economist or things like that. That's not true. Because all the findings within gender economics, like within behavioral economics, are based on a mainstream economics, but we also want to improve mainstream economics to make it better, uh, like within uh, behavioral economics did, and also that we have significant improvements already within uh, gender economics. And uh, gender economics, as I said, may improve mainstream economics in a similar way as a behavioral economics, and I'm sure that we're gonna have significant uh, improvements and remarkable achievements in this field in the future because there is a great room for improvement uh, and gender aware analysis uh, uh, analyzing inequality inclusiveness to improve overall economic performance and in general just to define gender economics if we define mainstream economics or classical economics as a study of scarce resources how to allocate those scarce resources how to use them in the most efficient way then gender economics, within gender economics, the fo focus is on inequality and inclusiveness. How basically to reduce inequality, to improve inclusiveness, to improve economic performances. We're going to talk about that later on today uh, 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 
in, in details, but the point, is, the point is that when you have inequality or uh, when you do not have inclusiveness, economic performances are not so good. And we may improve economic performances uh, by dealing with uh, inequality and inclusiveness issues uh, and by analyzing them and improving them not only within gender economics but also within other gender studies, in the first place law, sociology and others. Uh, but you'll see gender economics may help uh, in that respect uh, by quantifying certain things and by bringing objectivity because we are not talking just about something is fair or is not fair but definitely if we reduce or, or uh, uh, eliminate inequality we'll have better economic performance we'll have better allocation of resources so and that's evident that's uh, we may confirm that empirically and that's I think a, a huge advantage of gender economics compared to other social sciences because we may quantify things we may bring objectivity and we also may help other social sciences uh, to use those results and to basically uh, uh, solve many many issues related to inequality and inclusiveness we're going to analyze them some of them later on today but it's important to emphasize that relationship between inequality and economic performances so if it, societies uh, 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 that have huge uh, uh, gender inequality they, you may find a, a causal relationship with inequality and poor economic performances. So by reducing inequality, basically we may improve economic performances, but there are many, many different aspects and issues that we may analyze within gender economics. But if I would have to put in one word and to define it in one sentence, basically gender economics is a critical study of economics with a focus of, on gender aware and inclusive issues, because by analyzing those issues, we may basically improve allocation of resources and improve overall economic performances. And just a little bit about historical, of course, if you have any questions, right now we, we, we define gender economics and, and related that to, to, to other fields of economics. And, and Professor Vojadinovic mentioned that, that's also a good point. Uh, uh, we don't have clear boundaries between those subfields of economics. For example, behavioral economics, they have specific subject that they are analyzing, but they are ubiquitous, they, they may be applied in, in different fields of economics. It goes the same with gender economics. So it's not just some subfield of economics, but basically any aspects, any other subfield may rely upon gender economics. In any other subfield, including behavioral economics, you may analyze uh, 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 gender inequality and, and resulting inefficiencies uh, uh, that comes from, from gender inequality. So that's really important to, to emphasize that those boundaries are more theoretical then, uh, but in practice, if you're dealing with gender economics, basically uh, 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 the sky is the limit because all the issues that we are facing, uh, uh, you may include that perspective and analyze uh, gender inequality and resulting economic performances. So that's that's really important when it comes to gender economics. And once again, do you have any, any questions related to uh, this definition or, or some specific issues related to gender economics? Did you get some some picture of gender economics, what it is all about? So how how would you define in one word gender economics? Why do we need, if we need at all, gender economics? Well, inclusivity and equality and the principles and values that have been different. This gender economics as opposed to the... Yeah, please use the mic. Okay. And take your time. So, how you see gender economics? Well, I see gender economics as a different approach to economics in general that places more emphasis on equality and inclusion. So, we are, uh, while economics in general uh, deals with the scarcity of resources and how to allocate them uh, in the most efficient way, when we apply the gender economics approach, we're not talking just about efficiency, but also about equality, about some justice in the social system, etc. That would be the broad picture I got. Yeah, that's a really good answer. But just, just to clarify something, uh, yes, we are dealing with inequality and inclusiveness, all those issues, but in the first place, when it comes to gender economics, basically we are dealing with all those issues because we are interested in economic performances. So we want to maximize social welfare. We have, want to have a better society, wealthier society, and that's the main goal 
uh, that we are that we want to achieve within gender economics. But to achieve that goal, basically, we have to deal and we are dealing with uh, inequality and inclusiveness because those are major sources of economic inefficiencies that we are having today. And you'll see, even empirically, we have many, many evidence that by reducing inequality, for example, you have significant increase in GDP per capita. You have significant increase in, in salaries and some other uh, macroeconomic data. You may follow basically the progress in terms of economic performances when you reduce gender inequality or when you improve inclusiveness, especially when it comes to, to female labor force and, and labor markets. When you introduce something, for example, some amendments within labor law, you may follow the, the economic performances and basically a uh, 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 increase in social welfare. So that's that's the main point from the uh, point of view of economics and gender economics. But of course, to do that, to analyze that relationship, first of all, we have to deal with uh, with gender inequality and inclusiveness. And how we got here, uh, just a, a few words about historical development of gender economics. Uh, because for a long time, economists, they, they, they negated gender economics. They said something like that doesn't exist. We don't have gender economics. We don't want to deal with those issues. Th those are not issues relevant for economists. And for a long time, we had that state of play, especially uh, uh, before the First World War and even during the interwar period. Basically, we didn't have gender economics. And it's interesting how we got gender economics. First, we got household or home economics uh, as a new research field uh, at the University of Chicago during the interwar period. And household economics uh, basically is related to scientific management of the house traditionally led by women. And those are the roots of, of gender economics. Later on, you, you have some, uh, you may see some of the uh, milestone papers uh, they are they are extremely important for development of gender economics but essentially during 1970s we got uh, gender uh, economics in today's terms uh, 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 based on the development of household economics and development of household economics led to gender or feminist economics and uh, main findings of all those papers uh, and and gender economics in general main idea is that by reducing gender inequality and allocating female labor to its more productive use many industries may benefit and gender inequality gender inequality affects economic outcomes so that's the thing that's that's important we have causal relationship between inequality and economic outcomes or economic performances. And that's all about, to put it simple, it's, it's all about gender economics, to analyze how to, how to uh, basically reduce inequality and improve inclusiveness to get uh, better economic outcomes or, or better economic performances to maximize social welfare. Uh, to have a higher living standard in, in one word. So, and you'll see, uh, we'll analyze some specific issues and within those issues, you'll see the same pattern. We, we analyze those issues and we suggest some policy measures, for example, how to uh, uh, improve, uh, how to uh, getting uh, gender quality in certain field. And then we may measure, uh, uh, basically measure success uh, uh, by, by measuring economic uh, performances. Nicola, mm -hmm. just one question. I believe that you will mention it, but will you make differentiation between neoliberal economics and the classical one and the one more uh, oriented towards social welfare and redistribution? Because that differentiation, I think, also is very important in this context. Because you, you put into the definition social welfare, but neoliberal economics maybe does not put it in, in that uh, extent. Yes, into the, definitely. In, into the definition and the, the uh, st 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 strategy of the, of the development. Definitely, definitely. And that, that's also an important point because neoliberal economics. Uh, within neoliberal economics, the main point is to maximize social welfare. 
uh, and and they do not care about inequalities to say they they usually say that's not a question for economists it's important to, to maximize social welfare it's not important uh, gini index one of the indexes that we will mention it's not important who who um, uh, who gets what? So basically, uh, uh, inequality is not important. But when it comes to gender uh, economics, equality is really one of the central issues, and it's really important because without uh, equality and gender parity, which is also an uh, aspect that we will mention later on, uh, we simply cannot have uh, optimal e allocation of resources and optimal uh, uh, economic performances. So that's a huge upgrade to uh, neoliberal economics and I think huge improvements. But still, we do not exclude neoliberal economics or economics in general, but in my view, we are improving those fields by developing gender economics. But then mm -hmm. I'm interested in the definition of the social welfare in the neoliberal context. It, it is equalized more, I would say, or totally with the profit and in that more redistributive economics not in that sense would be defined or I'm wrong. Yeah, you may put it in that way, but uh, basically they are measuring uh, consumer surplus and producer surplus, and that's a total social welfare, and they want to maximize social wealth, total social welfare. So uh, that's those are the measurements, not the profit uh, itself, but also that, that plays an important role. Uh, but when it comes to profit, basically, as I said, uh, be because profit generates inequality in essence and they don't care about that and yeah that's that's the point that is my point yeah exactly exactly that was a really good point and when it comes to gender economics suddenly that's really important because if men uh, gets uh, all the profit then we'll have huge inequality and we will not have optimal location of resources now that's evident uh, for example 20 years ago 30 years ago that was questionable but i think now i think now that's that's really evident uh, uh due to the developments uh within gender economics and that's why gender economics uh, uh is really important because i think that slightly we are changing perspective uh, within economics and, and we are contributing to other uh, gender studies and social sciences like law and sociology by providing uh, basically empirical evidence that by reducing inequality and and uh, basically uh, we may improve economic outcomes and economic performances and and we may all live better so we have practical consequences it's not only about theory and and, and different divisions between subfields of economics but in in in, in, in practice, we have uh, significant uh, results by reducing inequality. Basically, we may measure, we'll see uh, during the next lecture, we'll analyze some of the main indicators and we'll see that when reducing inequality, we have significant improvements in economic performances. So that's why uh, gender economics matters. And I think that's why gender economics will be developed further in the future and it will become uh, a really significant, if not part of the mainstream economics, uh, I guess it will be a part of mainstream economics because those questions of, of inequality and, and gender and uh, inclusiveness, they are becoming really, really important. And we see that modern societies and modern economies cannot ignore those issues. Uh, or if they are ignoring those issues, they are facing serious troubles and, 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 and social problems and they will not have uh, they will not prosper, they will not have good economic performances. So that's why it's really important and, and uh, uh, to deal with gender economics and to develop this field further along with other uh, gender studies. And there is that connection law and gender economics or gender law and economics you may define as a special subfield. There, there is a huge room for, for development and improvement, but still we are talking about gender economics. And for example, we may analyze how to structure legal norms to enhance, enhance economic performance. Uh, for, for instance, how to structure the labor law to decrease gender inequality and enable efficient allocation of female labor. So within labor law, you may analyze certain amendments and then uh, by using economic indicators and gender indicators and observing, analyzing those issues, you may basically present the outcomes of those amendments. And that's really important because when we are talking about law uh, uh, as a social science, we may say, okay, this is fair, this is not fair. It is fair to prolong maternity leave. It is fair to have shorter maternity 
live. But we don't have any other criteria, objective criteria. But in terms of gender economics, basically we are providing those objective criteria because if you prolong maternity leave, then we may observe what are the consequences in terms of economics. Do we have a, a higher GDP? Uh, are we living better or not? So we may basically quantify that and we may confirm or, or basically uh, provide additional argument for, for amendments within labor law and other fields of law. So that's also why uh, this uh, interconnection between law and gender economics is really important and also gender economics and other social sciences. It, to put it simple, gender studies, they are all related and we are all <laughs> on the same task here, I would say to basically uh, uh, eliminate or reduce gender inequality and to have better societies, better economies, no matter whether we are dealing with gender economics or law and gender, uh, gen other gender studies. I think that we, we all have the same goal to, to reduce inequality and to live better at the end of the day. And gender economics may quantify that and may provide objective uh, uh, tools uh, to be used during the, the analysis. So, so far, do you have any, any other questions related to law and gender economics or, or um, gender inequality within society, economics, something like that? Uh, okay. Actually, okay. Also for, for the people online, if you have any, any questions, raise your hand anytime, feel free to ask. Uh, it would be really good to have a, a discussion. I understand that these are all, we are still at the beginning and these are all basic things, definitions, and later on we'll have more specific issues that will be more interesting uh, for, for, um, for a debate. So, so at, this, at this general level, uh, do you plan to say maybe that is not necessary i'm just asking just like that so in the interrelation between law uh, public policies economic policies e economic policy social policies and law and economics all together or not Actually, you're one step ahead of me. Uh, okay. That's really important and I'm going to tackle that in a minute because uh, so far we were dealing with uh, microeconomics and uh, how uh, individuals behave. But now we are going to macro level and macroeconomics and we are coming to, to public policies and law in general, why it's so important to, to be gender aware and to and how gender economics may help basically in creating public policies. That's really important part. Uh, but once again, that part is more, more related to macroeconomics, but still it's within gender economics and it's a, it's a legitimate choice. And some of the specific questions that issues that we will deal with is why do women have different economic opportunities in different countries? Uh, why do women earn less than men in different countries? Uh, we're going to discuss about uh, those indexes and, and those issues within the next lecture, but uh, this is just to, to give you a preview and, and also one significant aspect of gender economics. Suddenly we may compare different societies, suddenly we may compare different economies and see, basically analyze legal instruments, legal institutes and their effects within different societies and we may also compare different societies. For example, gender inequality index, you may see different colors and countries, we're going to talk about it later on, but the point is that by using gender economics we may compare different societies, we may compare different economies and we may analyze, better analyze uh, specific legal institutes. That's also really important and that's uh, essential for creating efficient public policies. And that's exactly the, the next important aspect of gender economics, uh, uh, public policies. That's basically gender economics and, and, and public policy and uh, macroeconomic, uh, macroeconomics and macroeconomic policy also for a long time uh, 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 is often thought as, as gender neutral. Basically, they negated uh, gender aware issues for a long, long time. They, 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 
almost uh, the same as with, with the classical economics. So they, they were completely blind uh, for, for gender inequality and, and inclusiveness and all other questions. But suddenly, uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, within gender economics, economists explain that economic policy choices affect women and men differently. Uh, because of their different positions in economy, both in market, paid and non-paid. So it's it's really important how you create public policy uh, and how that those policies will affect men and women. And basically, if you are uh, 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 creating even uh, creating gender inequality, then uh, you will uh, basically not you will not have uh, good economic performances. And that's why it's really important to be gender aware while, while creating uh, public policies and gender. Also, we, we may define that as a specific gender macroeconomics because, for example, some budget cuts and some macroeconomic measures, uh, uh, monetary measures, they will affect differently men and women. And basically, depending on that, you will have different economic outcomes. If we do not take into account gender uh, while creating public policy and monetary and fiscal policy, uh, that could be really hazardous and could be dangerous. I mean, for a, for a, for a society as a whole and for, for the economy. So in order to have efficient public policy measures and to increase uh, total social welfare and to create better societies and economies, it's really important to, to consult, I would say, gender economics when creating public policies and when changing legal institutes or amending uh, some of the crucial legal institutes. So that's why also uh, gender economics matters not only at a micro level, but also at macro level when creating public policies. That's why I said there are no clear boundaries, because wherever you are doing within an economy, within economy or within a legal system, you really have to deal with, with gender equality and gender issues if you want to have efficient outcomes in terms of economics, of course. Uh, so that's why introduction of public policy measures that are meant to reduce gender inequality and enhance economic performance are, are recent trends uh, in, in Europe in general, also in Serbia. So we are trying to introduce those policies to, to reduce or eliminate gender inequality and to increase economic performance. So that's why I said it's it's really important to, to uh, gender economics are, because uh, they are providing objective tool for for analysis and and basically they may uh, improve public policies improve every aspect of of our lives and and improve our societies in general it's not only about gender and inequality of course that's a central that's a central issue and it's really important but if we are handling that issue well then we'll have a wealthier societies and we'll have better economic performances so that's in essence that's all about uh, when it comes to gender economics. That's why it's really important to include gender issues and to be aware of gender when analyzing any issue related to economics and, and other social sciences. Uh, and concluding remarks, and then we may start with a, with a discussion on this general part, and if not, we may start with more specific issues, but I thought it's really important to, to understand the broader context, to understand the place of gender economics within economics and relation relationship with other social sciences and application on a micro and macro level, so it's, it's omnipresent, and that's why it's really important to have this broad picture and to understand what is gender economics, to be able to define gender economics. That's why this first lecture, even though it's more abstract, I, I think it's really important because it's a basis, it serves as a basis for all other things that more specific issues that we are going to analyze. So basically, gender economics, in short, may, may be defined as a subfield or a branch of economics with a focus on gender aware and inclusiveness inclusive issues and, and public policy. And it criticizes, but does not exclude classical economics. That's really important to emphasize because there is a there is a tension in, in within academia and economists, especially dealing with gender economics and economics. And basically they, they do not recognize each other at a certain extent, but it's really important to understand that gender economics basically is based on economics and many findings that we have, uh, explanations, how market functions, how consumers behave, producers behave. So we do not negate all those things, but we are taking them as granted and we are trying to improve the, the whole system. Uh, so basically, that's why uh, it's really important to emphasize that economics does not exclude gender economics and vice versa, but basically, we are using that all together to, 
to have wealthier society and, and to live better at the end of the day. And the ultimate objective of gender or feminist economics is to enhance the allocation of scarce resources and increase total social welfare. So, but also uh, uh, it implies uh, uh, the question of equality. I didn't emphasize that, but that's really important. But in general, the goal is to, to enhance the allocation of scarce resources, especially female labor and, and female skills and potentials that we are not using uh, currently, or many societies, uh, they do not use uh, enough currently, they, they do not rely enough on those resources. So basically, the ultimate goal of gender economics is to, to enhance allocation of resources, improve allocation of resources and to, to create better societies. But once again, it's important to, to emphasize that it's not only about gender economics, but all gender studies have to work together. Because gender economics, in my opinion, is just one aspect of gender studies, and they are all equally important to create, uh, to create uh, better societies and wealthier societies. Uh, uh, why gender economics uh, is relevant? Because it improves mainstream economics, as we explain, by explaining gender inequalities and related inefficiencies. So before, before gender economics, economists didn't even consider those issues, gender inequality. But suddenly, gender economics, within gender economics, we have empirical confirmation and explanations uh, of, of uh, how inequalities, gender inequalities uh, produce economic inefficiencies. So it's really important. And basically, gender economics prove that those issues, gender uh, equality issues are relevant for any who anyone who is dealing with economics. So uh, today, I think it's impossible, although they are economists that are still trying to do so, but I, I really think it's impossible to ignore this movement and those development that we have within gender economics. And also it's relevant because it may improve other social sciences, uh, as we explained, because it provides objective uh, objectivity and, and uh, tools for, for uh, conducting analysis within law, sociology and other social sciences. And also it enables gender aware legislation and public policy uh, or implementation of, of findings within gender economics on a macro level and, and ultimately providing a, a higher living standard. So that's why, uh, in short, gender economics matters. And I think it, it will become even more relevant and important in, in, in years to come. And definitely, as we got a Nobel Prize within uh, behavioral economics, uh, I would say that in some years from now, we could have a, a Nobel Prize in, in gender economics because it's really, it's really fundamental and it's really important. All those issues in modern societies, I think we, we cannot afford to ignore uh, those issues and, and not to deal with uh, gender equality and resulting economic performances. Okay, so basically those were uh, uh, the conclusions questions, for the first part and also, questions. yeah, I will have time for questions and discussion, but just not to forget, I always end a, a, a presentation with some quote uh, and it will be the same uh, with the second and third lecture. And uh, this is a um, Graka Michel. Uh, she is a former first lady of South Africa and Nelson Mandela's wife. And she said, gender equality is the goal that will help abolish poverty, that will create more equal economies, fairer societies, and happier men, women, and children. And that is really all about gender economics, uh, to abolish poverty and, and to, to, to basically, by, by dealing with uh, gender inequality, we are improving economic performances and we are making fairer societies and happier men, women, and children. So. Uh, in general, when, when talking about gender economics, I, in my opinion, this was an appropriate quotation, quote. Okay, now, uh, do we have any question online or, or from the people in the room? Just to check the time. So, we are on time, I guess. So, if the others are waiting and thinking about what to comment or ask. So I have one subversive question or comment, or two. One, Go ahead. One for definitely is subversive. So economics 
is based on inequality per se. So this quotation at the end, I think, responded to a certain extent to what I wanted to ask. So uh, exploitation and in structural inequality with gender economics could be only uh, could be only diminished. So e more equal, more uh, just, but not equal, not just. Uh, due to what she said and due to the logic of the capitalist economy. So that is my comment and I, I want to, to hear your feedback. And maybe there is also implied the response, maybe not. So I want to ask you uh, to explain or to tell your opinion uh, about the interrelation of the mainstream economics and the gender economics on the other side, because uh, due to this, what I said about uh, economics as based on structural inequalities, maybe there is uh, the source and the reason for the distance and the suspic suspicion towards gender econ economics from the mainstream. So. The third sub-question is how much the mainstream economics can be gender mainstreamed and where are the limits of that gender mainstreaming? Thank you. Thank you so much. These are, these are all uh, great, great questions. Uh, uh, and when it comes to inequality, yes, that, that's a really good observation. Uh, uh, basically even inequality in general like economic inequality that that's a question per se and it was also recently let's say discovered and analyzed within economics starting from piketty and also branko milanovic one of the most famous economists he graduated from university of belgrade faculty of economics uh, uh, but that's that's true within capitalism and mainstream economics uh, uh, we assume that there is some kind of inequality economic inequality uh, it's impossible to, to have perfectly equal, uh, I would say, society or economic equality. So to have perfect economic equality, to everybody earn the same amount, spend the same amount. So it's it's really impossible, I would say. But still, I think based on, on, on uh, contributions uh, made by Branko Milanovic within inequality economics and, and also gender economics, I think that... Uh, we may tolerate some kind of inequalities which are based on different productivities of individuals. Uh, but still, uh, those things that we have today, uh, they are beyond the imagination. They are, they are so far away from, from those tolerated values, I would say. I don't know how to explain, but we have uh, uh, economic inequality beyond control. It's impossible to control that right now. And Piketty is writing about that and Milanovic also. And it's to, to, to a large extent related to gender. So that's why, yes, uh, it's impossible to completely eliminate uh, gender inequality. But I think the gender economics and mainstream economics, and that's the answer to, to the third question also, how we may uh, make mainstream economics more gender sensitive. Uh, I think that this goes uh, uh, hand by hand uh, mainstream economics and gender economics when dealing with inequality and gender inequality that we should reduce gender inequality and it's good I think because gender economics contributed in that sense because it provided really valuable findings that countries those countries who reduce gender inequality they got increase in GDP they got uh, better economic performances that may be followed by by uh, tracking uh, uh, gender indicators we're going to talk about that later on uh, but definitely, I think now, today, it's not a question anymore, should we react and should we uh, uh, fight uh, gender and economic inequality? We should do that. Where is the limit, honestly, uh, <laughs> uh, on some abstract level, I would say that we should eliminate all inequalities uh, that are not based on, on a different productivity. And that would be my answer in some ideal world. Uh, but I guess in any event, we are so far away from that that uh, we have a long way to go 
to, to reach that limit and to, to talk about that limit. I think that we have more important and fundamental issues to, to deal with uh, right now because uh, unfortunately, gender economics, it's, it's considered as a, as a new research field, a new sub-branch of economics, even though that, that should be part of mainstream economics, definitely. In, in 21st century, uh, in, in the societies that we are having and, and problems that we are facing, definitely economic inequality and gender inequality are, are crucial issues. And that's why I think gender economics may help in dealing with those issues and providing uh, quantitative analysis providing useful tools not only for economists but also for lawyers and all other so social scientists uh, when dealing with economic inequality because once again I, I really believe this is not only a question relevant for economists uh, how much inequality we may tolerate but also for lawyers also for sociologists also for other uh, uh, social scientists and I really think that we all have to work on this together and and from from uh, 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 optimistic point of view, I think there is a huge room uh, for improvement, and and we should we should use this opportunity to to improve our societies. Okay, so do we have any any other? Uh, could you make some comment on on economic inequality or gender inequality? What do you think about that? Should we all be equal or not in terms of economics? For example, just just before you start, Piketty wrote about that. For example, if, if you had rich parents, you don't have to do anything till the rest of your life. And within classical economics, somehow that's fine. We are not equal in terms of economics. We have economic inequality and everything functions well. So do you think that's fine or, or we should do something about that? Well, I don't think that we should all be equal because that's an unrealistic goal. I mean, we can talk about idea typically uh, the communist regime or whatever, the socialism or the complete equality, but that's uh, neither, uh, shall we say, uh, it can be reached. And even if it was, I think that would cause people not to be motivated to work because if we all have the equal resources, then nobody has any reason to work harder because it's all the same. But I do believe that we should work on inequality in the uh, sense that there is uh, there are many extremes. There are people who do not have enough for a decent living, and that should be remedied. So I think there should be less variance in the poorest and the richest people, but of course inequality is part of life in every aspect, not only in economics, and it can be eradicated, and it shouldn't, because those differences are what make people progress and try to find new way, ways to improve their work, to improve their activity in any way so they can reach the next level. If there are no next levels, then the whole society will stagnate and just say, we're fine where we are. <laughs> this is great, in my opinion. So I, I, that's why I would like to ask you, do you have any solution for, for current problems that we are facing? <laughs> We agree on this that, that you said, but do you have any, any solutions to suggest? Well, not at the moment. It's <laughs> too fast a question. <laughs> okay, this was interesting. So do we have any other questions or comments? Uh, yeah, I just checked chat, so we don't have any, any questions in the chat. You may write down or you may ask online wherever you prefer. Feel free to ask once again. You saw it's nothing. Uh, <laughs> it's 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 really uh, we are really, really having a friendly discussion, and I think that's that's really uh, the most productive way to, to have a discussion without any any boundaries. And this question of inequalities is really important, and and you. You made a good point. It affects productivity, and that's that's really important. So it's the it's the point is to find a balance between uh, protecting productivity and and protecting equality. So that's some kind of 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 a balance that we should strive to and that we should achieve. So that's that's really important because if we are all equal, as you not, noted, uh, is 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 really. Uh, Basically, in terms of economics, it will uh, reduce productivity and we will not maximize social welfare and achieve all other goals that I mentioned. So that's why uh, I said we have to tolerate some kind of uh, uh, 
economic inequality, but not gender inequality. That's also important to distinguish. We're, we're going to talk about that during the second lecture. Uh, but still, uh, at, with the current state of play that we have, I think there is the, there is a, a lot of things to do, and we ha we have to do a lot of things basically. And hopefully, gender economics uh, will contribute to 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 that and to other social sciences dealing with uh, gender inequality and and gender sensitive issues. So, uh, if we do not have uh, uh, questions related to this first general definition of gender economics. I think that now we have some kind of broad picture what is gender economics and what do we think when we say gender economics and the relationship between gender economics, economics and other social sciences. That that was the goal uh, <laughs> of this first lecture and that's I think really important basis because we are still, unfortunately, we are still struggling with those basic terms and with the place of gender economics within social sciences. So that's why I wanted to, to make it clear and to make a base for, for further analysis. And then we may analyze more, more specific issues and, and suggest some more specific solutions. That's why maybe it's not so fruitful for, for discussion. Those, those issues are more abstract on some abstract level, but I really thought it's important to, to, to clarify those things and to, to, to set the scene and to, to, to explain what's what's the role of gender economics and the relationship between gender economics and, and other social sciences and uh, as you saw it's it's gender economics uh, it, it is really important uh, uh, field uh, of of social science and it will i believe it will become even more important in in, in the years ahead and we may expect even even uh, more specific findings that will enable other social sciences uh, to to basically create better societies and that's the ultimate goal just one short question so uh, the interrelation between those dominant or mainstream economists professionals mm -hmm. who if i'm not wrong have been uh, neoliberal ones on the second place, you mentioned Piketty, Milanovic, and there are the others, critical economists, critical economy orientation within the profession, and among them, sub, how to say, field of gender economists. So the interrelation between those uh, belonging to the critical ones, including those who accept gender perspective, feminist perspective in in in, in the economics and mm -hmm. uh, field of research and education and those mainstream liberal economists. Okay, this is also really really good question, a theoretical one. Uh, uh, I think today it's really hard to, to make hard hard boundaries between. Uh, specific fields within social sciences in general and it goes the same with economics and, and subfields within economics uh, but for example economists dealing with economic inequality like Piketty, Milanovic they didn't explicitly deal with uh, uh, gender inequality they're mentioning gender inequality but they didn't specifically deal with those issues but still I think when while working on issues related to economic inequality, being aware of that or not, they are also working as gender economists. And that's also really important that we don't have clear boundaries, but we are all uh, on the same page here. And even though if they do not recognize the fact that they are dealing with gender economics, they do. They do when analyzing economic inequalities and, and they are even more than that, they are confirming relevance of gender economics and analyzing inequalities and, and uh, resulting economic performances. So uh, uh, implicitly, Piketty and Milanovic uh, and other economists, famous economists dealing with economic inequality, they are confirming relevance of, of gender economics and, and gender equality and, and resulting uh, economic performances. So, And when we... Uh name them or qualify as the critical econ economists, professionals, uh, if I understand well, they, are crit they criticize 
the dominant neoliberal strategy of economic development. Yes, that, that's correct. Uh, in my opinion, also, they are criticizing neoliberal economics. Uh, uh, but once again, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, they're not negating that kind of, of, of study, but they're trying to improve it. And it, it's the same with, with gender economics. Honestly, it's really hard for me to understand how somebody would say gender economics doesn't exist or something like that. Uh, or uh, inequalities, uh, they are not relevant uh, within economics. It's really hard for me to understand um, that kind of statement or attitude. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we have all those things. Uh, today, uh, but luckily, I think that we are going in a, in the right direction, and this this project and and, and gender studies in general, I think uh, they are a significant part of 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 uh, this fight for for better societies and better economies in general. So, yes, I, I try to to define in in theory in general gender economics, but as you saw in all other fields, some fields of economics and other fields of social sciences. Being aware of that or not, we are all dealing with uh, with the same issues: issues inequality, of gender inequality, inclusiveness, inclusiveness and and and. But here only the the accent is on economic performances. That could be that could be a, a specificum or specific for gender economics. But still, we are dealing, uh, we are analyzing the same subject matter, and we are dealing with the same problem in general. That's why we have to work together. Thank you for for all those issues. It, uh, those issues, those questions ba basically clarified a lot, I think, and now we have even even better picture uh, in general of, of gender economics. Uh, so do we have uh, other questions or comments? Okay, then we could make like three to five minutes break and start with the next lecture. Okay, so now it's uh, just to check the time. It's six oh six. So let let's start in four minutes. Okay, just to change the slides and to take some coffee. Okay. <laughs>